Okay, we can go ahead and get started. It is the top of the hour. First, I wanted to say hi, everyone, and thank you again for joining us tonight. We are really looking forward to this evening's talk. First, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll introduce our panelists, and we'll dive right into the program. So my name is Michaela Morris, and I'm an Oceans Associate with Environment America. We are a nationwide network of state-based nonprofits that work to protect clean air, clean water, and open spaces, the ocean included in those open spaces. So tonight, you'll hear first from Amy, Wh Amy Warren, right whale research assistant at the New England Aquarium, about her work researching right whales. Next, you'll hear from Bill McQueenie, environmental educator and principal investigator with the Calvin Project, about his experiences working to save the species. Then I'll share a little bit of information about the relationship between right whales and policy, and what you can do to help save the species. Finally, after that, we'll open it up so you can ask us all some questions. You can use the chat function at the end of the program to ask these questions. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Michaela. So I, my name is Amy Warren. I'm a research assistant with the Cross Marine Mammal Program at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. We're located in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'll be talking to you about North Atlantic right whales and the research we do at the aquarium. And so just to start with a brief overview about North Atlantic right whales, they got their name from being the right whale to hunt because they're large fat bodies. They have very thick blubber or fat layers. And these very thick blubber fat, fat layers produce a large amount of oil back in the whaling days. They're also slow moving and buoyant once they're killed, so they're a very easy target in the early days of whaling. And whaling is what's responsible for decimating their population, which may have been as low as only a dozen individuals in the 1930s. They gained protection from whaling in 1935 and have been fighting to come back since then. Uh, they are baleen whales. They don't have teeth. Instead, they have these fringy plates in their mouth that are a large filtering system. Uh, which is helpful because they eat very small food. They feed exclusively on copepods, which are very small zooplankton. So their baleen plates allow them to filter the copepods out of the water and allows them to eat a lot at once, as they're typically trying to get about, about a billion copepods a day, or around 2,000 pounds. And right whales are uniquely identified by their very dark, nearly black skin. They don't have a dorsal fin on their back and they have callosities all over their head, which I'll explain shortly. And North Atlantic right whales are considered to be critically endangered. The most recent population update we have is about 356 individuals. Uh, well, they made a comeback since they stopped being hunted, they are now in decline again, and this is mostly now due to entanglements and vessel strikes. So the reason we know so much about this population is because we're able to identify individual right whales. Right whales are born with rough patches of skin around their head. These rough patches vary in size and shape for each whale. The rough patches become home to siamids, also known as whale lice. These lice only congregate on the rough patches and being white in color, they provide contrast in order to see what we call the callosity patterns. These patterns are fairly easy, easily visible even from a distance and are unique to each whale. And once the whales are full grown, these patterns don't change much, if at all. And this next image shows you examples. We break down the callosities into two different types, broken or continuous, but they can vary a lot uh, between each and every whale. And this is kind of just a breakdown of all the different um, callosity patches and the names we give them to help us identify them. So this map shows the range for most North Atlantic right whales. Their preferred prey is only prevalent in colder waters. So most of their feeding in the Northeast um, from basically from Canada uh, down to the waters off of Long Island, New York. And the migratory path follows the coastline down to the calving grounds, which are located off, off the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida. Uh, typically these whales aren't really going past um, Cape Canaveral, but occasionally we get some whales that will uh, wander into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but um, pretty much past Canaveral is about as far as they go. Uh, but actually only a small pop portion of the population travels down to the southeast. 
uh, mostly just pregnant females who give birth to their calves in the warmer waters down there because uh, the newborn whales don't yet have the warm blubber layer to keep them warm in the cold waters off New England and Canada. But since most of their food is in the colder waters of the north, whales are actually fasting when they're down in the calving grounds. So it's a lot of work for these moms to not only care for the young, but also be fasting while they're doing so. So far, most of my time studying right whales has been in the calving grounds of the southeast U.S. where I participated in aerial surveys. Seeing whales from a plane at about a thousand feet is a really unique perspective. You do lose a couple senses not being able to hear the hear or smell the ocean or the whales, but you can see into the water and see much more of what's happening under the surface. In the calving grounds, most of our sightings tend to be of mothers and their newborn calves. There really isn't anything more special watching than watching a mother and calf interacting. These calves are born in the winter, and sometimes we'd see baby whales that are only a couple days old. While they look small next to mom, these calves are about 15 feet long the day they're born, but they do grow very quickly. They separate from their mothers usually by the next winter, winter to live a fairly solitary life. So the short time these pairs have together is very important. And one particularly interesting story I remember was off the coast of Georgia. We were circling a very playful calf that was just breaching over and over. While photographing, we noticed there was a great white shark nearby that was kind of inching slowly closer to the calf who was still breaching, just jumping out of the water, not a care in the world. Uh, we actually hadn't seen mom in a while, but it's not uncommon to, for a calf to play at the surface while mom is down on a deeper dive. But then out of nowhere, the mom launched herself out of the water, making a huge splash when she landed. Uh, the splash also happens to make a very loud sound under the surface of the water where sound travels better. Uh, within a few moments, her calf was right alongside her and the shark turned and swam away, smart enough not to mess with a protective mom. Uh, so just one example of some of the really cool things that we get to experience on the water. So right whale research has been going on at the New England Aquarium continuously since 1980. Uh, just some of the work we do includes we manage the North Atlantic right whale photo identification catalog because I mentioned we can ID them. Uh, we do some field work, mostly vessel surveys where we're working on photo ID. Uh, we're photographing, looking at their health, uh, doing some sampling, and we also study health and human impacts, looking closely at the scars on the whale's body caused by fishing gear and vessels, and just kind of overall their health, their body condition, and what's going on with them. So my team manages the ID catalog by organizing photos of sightings of right whales that come in from all over the North Atlantic. Uh, lately, we've been receiving over 4,000 sightings each year. So far, we've identified over 700 individual right whales. This includes whales that are now dead, as the population is, again, around 350. Uh, but our sightings date as far back as 1935. So there's a lot of information in this catalog. Uh, we give each of these whales a four-digit catalog number, but some are also given nicknames, which helps us ID them in the field quickly. Uh, for example, this whale shown here is a whale named Boomerang, and she's named so uh, for a scar on her tail that's in the shape of a boomerang. So cataloging whales and all of their sightings allows us to keep track of things like age, offspring, injuries, and also just keep track of where they're going. And this catalog is available to, the, to peruse online, and I invite all of you to check it out. I included the website down at the bottom. Scars are also used for identification, but unfortunately these scars all come from human causes, uh, mostly vessel strike and entanglements in fishing gear, which leads me into um, studying health and human impacts. As we sift through these sightings allows us to better understand their lives by looking closely at their body condition and new scars each year, we can tell when and sometimes even where these whales are getting injured and understanding their injuries can help inform management of fisheries and vessels in hopes to prevent future interactions. For example, asking ships to slow down in certain areas where whales are present and attempting to make ropes and fishing gear safer for whales. So all of my team's field work is boat-based and we focus on various feeding grounds in the Northwest Atlantic. In the springtime, we work with other research teams in Cape Cod Bay, which is a, a main feeding area for them in the early spring. 
Uh, we work with Watoll Oceanographic Institute and NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Then in the summer months, our team breaks up into smaller groups and focuses on two different areas. Uh, we typically run several long offshore research cruises on a larger chartered vessel in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. These trips are a combined effort with our team as well as other research groups collaborating on various aspects of right whale research, including photo ID, but also acoustics and plankton sampling. And simultaneously, we run day trips in the Bay of Fundy based out of Lubeck, Maine. And then the next image should be a map. And so this is the same map as I showed earlier, but zoomed in on the feeding grounds. So kind of New England and Canada. And so as I mentioned, our longer offshore trips are in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is circled near the top. And then our day trips in the Bay of Fundy are based in that um, small purple box in the center, Graminan Basin. That's where all of our Bay of Fundy work is based. And then um, Cape Cod Bay is down towards the bottom. And so this is our research vessel, Nereid. Uh, we've been using this vessel every year in the Bay of Fundy since 1981. Uh, she's basically another member of our team. Uh, while conducting our field work, we have several goals. When we find right whales, our initial goal is always to get good photo documentation. Oftentimes, we're able to identify the whale in real time. We want to do this so we can de determine if it's been sampled or not. This is important because our goal is to get a biopsy sample from every whale in the catalog, but also avoid sampling whales more than once. This biopsy sampling is done by using a crossbow and a specialized arrow, which collects a small chunk of skin and blubber. And these biopsy samples can allow us to determine sex and genetics, things that we can't tell just by photographing. The longer term benefits of photo documentation allow us to track the locations of right whales over time, as well as their apparent health. Knowing where right whales are throughout the year allows us to provide valuable information to regulators managing ship traffic and fishing methods. And that's all I have for you today. Back to you, Michaela, I think. So, oh, Amy, thank you, Amy. Um, and that was a great presentation. Every time I hear you talk about right whales, I am just more and more amazed by them. And especially I hadn't heard that story before about the right whale, the mom and the, and the shark. So thank you for sharing those stories with us. <laughs> Up next, we have Bill McQueenie, um, who will be sharing some stories about his work with the Calvin Project, uh, based up in Maine. And I'll hand it over to you, Bill. Okay, thanks, Michaela. We can go to the next slide. So the Calvin Project is run by a group of seventh and eighth grade students from the Adams School in Castine, Maine. They call themselves the Calvineers. The students are trying to save the endangered North Atlantic right whale from going extinct. The mission of the Calvin Project is endangered species recovery through education. Next. The Cal, Um, as principal investigator for the Calvin Project, my main goals are to embed right whale science in the science curriculum, while at the same time embedding the students in the scientific community studying right whales. The students meet once a week after school to learn about marine mammal biology, physiology, and behavior with right whales as the primary subject. The weekly lessons often piggyback on the regular science lessons. So when we study, when, when the students are studying the human respiratory system, the Calvineers will then study the right whale's respiratory system. When they study Newtonian physics, they will then study how much force a right whale can make to break a fishing rope, for instance. When they study protein synthesis, they apply it to the hairs on the chin of a right whale. And when they study the ecology of the ocean, they then study the right whale's role in supplying nutrients and to phytoplankton and sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. The Calvineers attend three major field trips each year. They first visit Campobello Island in Canada and go on a whale watch with Captain Mackie Green. 
a member of the Camp Abello whale rescue team. They see humpback, minke, and fin whales up close in Mackey's small boat. In 2019, the Calvinias got to see a foraging right whale, something very special. After the whale watch, the Calvinias are given a talk by Mackey about how whales are disentangled and just how dangerous that job is. On the same field trip, the Calvinias then visit the New England Aquarium Right Whale Research Station in Lubeck, Maine. The scientists give numerous talks about their research project and how the team maintains the right whale catalog. After the talks, the Calvinias have dinner with the researchers with a meal cooked by the cook. The second field trip the Calvinias experience is a three-day trip to the annual right whale consortium, usually held at the New Bedford Whaling Museum each fall. Here, the Calvinias do two things. They set up posters showing their most recent work to help save the right whales. The Calvinias also attend a dozen or more talks from scientists about research work they are interested in. In addition, each Calvinia is able to talk one-on-one -on -one with scientists during the breaks. Many right whale scientists become mentors for the students over their two-year term as a Calvinia. After these two field trips, the Calvinias are ready to create a PowerPoint about the right whale story and the problems right whales face. In their PowerPoint, they highlight current research and let the audience know how they can help right whales. The PowerPoint is a little different every year, but always has as its theme the life of Calvin the right whale. Calvin is a right whale who was born in 1992. In the summer of that year, she was in the Bay of Fundy when her mother was hit by a ship and killed. Calvin was orphaned at a very young age and survival was doubtful. But the next year, she showed up in the Bay of Fundy and looked quite healthy. She was named after the cartoon character Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes because she was such a feisty young whale. It was only after she was named that the scientists found out Calvin was a female from genetic testing. When Calvin was nine years old, she was found severely entangled in Cape Cod Bay. The Center for Coastal Studies Disentanglement Team was able to get a satellite buoy attached to her, and for 36 days, she traveled hundreds of miles until the buoy and the line was shed and Calvin was free. But to this day, Calvin bears the scars of that entanglement and five others prior to that. In 2005, Calvin was sighted off North Carolina with a calf of her own. Her first calf would become known as Hobbs. Calvin has gone on to beat the odds and have three more calves, her, her latest just last year. So Calvin has experienced the problems of being a right whale, but she has also become a productive and successful mother able to help increase the right whale population. So telling about Calvin's 28 year life history is a perfect way for the Calvinias to explain the plight of the right whales today. Scientists like Amy Knowlton have mentioned the Calvinia, has met, have mentored the Calvinias. Amy Knowlton's work with weak ropes is a story the Calvinias have embraced in their PowerPoints. Knowlton found out that right whales were being entangled at an increased rate after the development of copolymer ropes in the 1990s that had a breaking strength of 3,000 3, pounds or more. Knowlton's published research indicated that fishing ropes should not exceed 1,700 pounds breaking strength if a right whale even a young right whale was to break free of the rope. Fishermen in Massachusetts developed a sleeve that broke at 1,700 pounds and put those sleeves in their end lines. They have fished these sleeves 
for four years without any major problems. This slide will show you uh, uh, Calvinier Hazel Sheehan, and she's demonstrating how to actually put a sleeve in the end lines. Being used in the fishing industry have caused more entanglements than before their use. It is a fact that stronger ropes also cause more severe entanglements than before. Right now, the best solution is to put 1,700 pound sleeves in end lines every 40 feet or so. This will allow right whales to break free more easily when entangled, and that will cause less severe wounds. Some fishermen are already fishing with these sleeves with good results. The sleeves work in their haulers and are strong enough for most gear situations. This solution is not going to put anybody out of business. It only takes a minute or so to splice a sleeve in. Like this. Next slide, please. We know that So the Calvinias traveled to many schools and organizations giving their presentation and informing people about the right whale predicament. Some of the recent venues they have presented at include local public schools, the Maine Maritime Academy, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, the Coast Guard, the Wilson Museum, the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, and the New England Aquarium's Lowell Lecture Series. When they go on field trips, they stop at local schools in the area to present. In addition, they have presented outside of New England, specifically in Quebec, in New Brunswick, in New York City, Tampa, Florida, and most recently last year in Barcelona, Spain. The third field trip the Calvinias attend is to the New England Right Whale Festival in May. This festival was actually inspired by a Calvinier, Drake Janes, in 2014 when he wrote the education department at the New England Aquarium and he asked if they would help co-sponsor the event. The festival now has been going on for six years. Here is where the Calvinias share the floor with scores of organizations all trying to help save the right whales. They make and explain posters and they give demonstrations. Their most famous demonstration is dressing up like a right whale to highlight the right whale's anatomy. The tough thing about being a Calvinier is seeing all the right whales that have been accidentally killed and injured by ships and entanglements. Indeed, this is the toughest toughest thing scientists deal with. It is not uncommon to see tears in the eyes of scientists cutting into a dead right whale that they have known so well during a necropsy. NOAA has determined that not even one right whale per year should die if the whales are going to have a chance to recover. But the average over the, over the last decade is more than two right whales dying per year, and most of those are from entanglements. And those are recorded deaths. Scientists estimate that for every right whale recorded death, there is at least another death not recorded, like Admiral, who went missing soon after this photograph of her was taken. Hobbs, Calvin's first calf, born on December 30th, 2004, was seen multiple times from 2005 to 2011. 
But since 2011, Hobbs has not been seen. She is presumed dead. Protocol lists whales not seen for six years as deceased. So the deaths that are reported are not all the deaths of right whales happening. Hobbs may have been hit by a ship or even tangled in fishing gear and drowned. There is no way of knowing, but one thing is certain. The only way a young right whale will die is by ship strike or entanglement. There are no natural predators of right whales and there have been no diseases reported in more than 40 years of study. Right whales can live to be 70 years and older if they are not accidentally killed. The right whale population is declining because of human caused deaths. Although they be accidental deaths, the toll will lead to extinction of the North Atlantic right whale. The hope is that we can stop the deaths and severe injuries. We have the means to do that. All we need is the will. The Calvinias speak out. They write letters to politicians. In 2008, they wrote President Bush urging him to pass the ship speed rule, which was passed later that year. This year, they have filled out postcards urging Congress to pass the Save Right Whale Act. Don't click it yet. I'll leave you with a vision of hope for the right whales. The Calvinias have been lucky enough to attend three international meetings of the Society for Marine Mammalogy. In 2009, they gave a plenary talk at the Quebec City receiving a standing ovation from 1,800 scientists. In 2013, they presented to schools in the Tampa Bay area while presenting posters at the 19th Biennial Conference. And in December of 2019, they presented at the Second World Marine Mammal Conference in Barcelona, Spain. Here, they were asked to give a talk about how climate change has led to the demise of right whales um, in the last decade. So here's a short clip of their presentation. It's gonna be a minute or two, so you might wanna just sit down on the top and read quietly out loud to yourself somewhere. When they did not find sufficient food in the Bay of Fundy, many gray whales roamed in the areas north of Nova Scotia. Conservation efforts should focus more on models and predictions Thank you, Bill, for that presentation. Um, oh, we yep. still have a few more slides. Sorry about that. Yeah, there's just one more slide. So to summarize, the Calvinians are trying to educate people so they will speak up for right whales. There are good solutions to the entanglement and ship strike problems that will not jeopardize the fishing industry or the um, shipping industry. What is needed is a willingness on the part of humans to put these solutions into action. Knowing the facts will give people ammunition to advocate for right whales. And if, yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill, for that presentation. Um, I love the Right Whale Bill of Rights. I hadn't seen that before. Um, and I just think it's such a great document and really powerful. And. Up next, um, I will be speaking about the policy solutions, in particular, a proposed rule um, and a NOAA comment period that we have to protect our right whales. Tough act to follow behind Bill and Amy because they have some really, really excellent charismatic stories about the species and uh, the people they've worked together with to protect them. Um, but this is another really important part of the puzzle to protect the species and I'm excited to share it with you. So as I mentioned earlier this evening, my name is Michaela Morris and I'm an Oceans Associate with Environment America. I coordinate our Save Right Whales campaign and I also lead our grassroots oceans organizing project called Voices for Our Oceans. You can email me after um, if you want more information about that. We are always looking for new volunteers to get involved. 
but I have spent the last year and a half immersed in building support for the policy solutions that we have to protect our North Atlantic right whales. And while there are really, really important ongoing lawsuits that help pr to protect the species, like one filed by the Center for Biological Diversity, the Conservation Law Foundation, and a few other environmental groups. And we also have really important legislation like the Save Right Whales Act that Bill mentioned. Tonight, I will be focusing on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration rule rulemaking process to reduce right whale entanglements. As we are expecting some developments in the next few months and you might have the opportunity to participate and take action. So, First, tell a story between right whales and policy. We actually need to rewind back over 40 years to the 1970s when Congress passed the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. In the early 1970s, scientists and the general public grew increasingly concerned about the harm being inflicted by human activities on our wildlife and our wild places. Some examples, toxins from industrial runoff, polluted waters across the United States and industrial production spewed smoke into our air, degrading air quality, support for cleaning up and protecting our air, water, and public lands mounted, creating a culture that helped drive our lawmakers to take action. In 1972, Congress passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act. There are four types of marine mammals, pinnipeds, which are seals, sea lions, and walruses, sirenians, which are manatees and dugongs, and marine fissipeds, polar bears and sea otters. A lot of people don't know polar bears are marine mammals, in fact, um, and cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Our North Atlantic right whales are considered a, cita a cetacean. The Marine Mammal Protection Act prohibits the take of marine mammals, which is the hunting, harassing, or killing on the high seas. It also regulates the import of marine mammal products into the United States. So because right, North Atlantic right whales are marine mammal, the Marine Mammal Protection Act helps protect them. In 1973, Congress passed another piece of landmark legislation called the Endangered Species Act. The purpose of the bill is to protect and recover species at risk of extinction. Since the bill was passed, North Atlantic right whales have been listed as endangered. And taken together, these two bills provide a framework that ultimately gives us the capacity to protect the species. Two decades later, after the original passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, amendments to the bill continued to support right whale restoration. In 1994, Congress amended the Marine Mammal Protect Protection Act to establish a stock assessment report program. So what is a stock assessment report? Essentially, the US government works with scientists to count the population of each species of marine mammals in United States waters at least once every three, week three years. The graph to the right shows right whale population over time and was taken from the 2019 right whale stock assessment report to give you an idea of the kind of information that these reports contain. Such reports help scientists and conservationists determine whether current conservation measures are enough and whether more needs to be done. Each report must categorize a stock as strategic or not strategic. If a stock is strategic, the MMPA must says that we must establish a take reduction plan to help the species recover. All stocks listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act are considered strategic. So the North Atlantic right whales are considered strategic and we had to establish a take reduction plan to help them out. In 1996, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration did just that and convened the take reduction team for Atlantic large whales to help reduce the takes of right whales, humpback whales, and fin whales in Atlantic fisheries. Specifically, the team aimed to reduce right in whale entanglements in fishing gear. Since the first take reduction plan was released, it has been modified several times. So as the graph on the previous slide showed, after a few decades of population increases, the 2010 saw a beginning of a decline in the population of right whales, which both Bill and Amy shared and talked more about. In 2017, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration declared an unusual mortality event when 17 right whales died in one year. Unusual mo mortality events require NOAA to take immediate action. So in August 2019, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration published a notice that they will begin a process to update the take reduction plan. And that is the process that we are in the middle of right now.
Last year, they began, NOAA began the rulemaking process to modify the plan. First, they held a series of scoping hearings across New England with stakeholders, including the fishing industry, the general public, and conservationists. The public was also invited to submit comments on right whales and measures to protect them. For the last year since that comment period closed in September of 2019, NOAA has been considering these comments and working to publish a draft rule. We expect the draft rule to be published sometime in the next few months since a judge ruled that the final rule must be published by May 31st of 2021. Ultimately, we want the rule to do everything it can to prevent right whale entanglements in fishing gear. At Environment America, some of the measures we hope to see the rule include Number one, increased monitoring of right whales and their food sources. To best protect right whales, we must know their location and the movement of copepods, one of their food sources is a valuable indicator. Number two is the closure of right whale habitat to vertical line seasonally. So using the best available science, NOAA should close areas where right whale aggregates typically formed to using vertical fishing line while the right whales are in town. Closing these known right whale habitats to fishing really does reduce the risk of vertical line entanglement, which as we know is a leading cause of right whale death. And finally, the funding for the testing and implementation of ropeless fishing gear. So by supporting the development and implementation of ropeless fishing gear, NOAA can both support the fishing industry and also limit the risk of right whale entanglement. Right now, scientists in the fishing industry are testing out different models of this ropeless fishing gear. Typically, a vertical line will connect lobster buoys to traps on the ocean floor. And the goal of ropeless is to allow fishermen to fish without these vertical lines. For example, with one type of ropeless fishing equipment, a trap sits on the seafloor, outfitted with a GPS and a lift bag or buoy. The fisherman is then able to find the trap using the GPS location. The fisherman could send a signal to the trap, which would cause the lift bag or buoy to rise to the surface and can then pull the trap into the boat. In the future, ropeless could offer a solution that both supports industry and saves our North Atlantic right whales. So that leads me to the final slide of tonight's program before we jump into questions that anyone has. What can you do? So we know that the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act provide a framework to protect our species from extinction. But winning protections for right whales that will keep them safe, healthy, and alive for centuries to come depends on showing our decision makers that we want them to do everything they can to save the species. This work begins with sharing information about why these whales are so special with your social networks, your friends, and your family, just like the Calvineers have done. Then, in a few months when the proposed rule come out, comes out, you can submit a comment to show NOAA how much you care about the species and want the federal agency to do everything they can to save them from extinction. The good news is we know that we have the tools and if we can, as Phil mentioned earlier, get the, up the willpower, we can save the species. So thank you everyone um, for joining tonight and we would now like to open the floor to questions. You can chat them um, to, you can chat them to the panel using the chat function. And then I will direct them. Um, okay, great. Question from Michelle. Um, when going on a whale watch in Plymouth, Massachusetts, are those all right whales that are observed? And I'll add my own question. Um, if they're not right whales, what kind of whales would they be? And that might be a good one for Amy. Uh, so there's actually lots of whales right off the coast of Plymouth. Um, you could see right whales. It's very possible. It usually depends on the time of year, um, but typically maybe in that area more so in the spring and the fall. Um, so in the summertime, the whales seen mostly off of Plymouth would be humpback whales, also fin whales, minke whales, and Atlantic white-sided dolphins. Those are the most common um, things you would see in a whale watch. And also uh, right whales are protected more so than other species that you actually cannot approach right whale within 500 yards unless you have a special permit, uh, which whale watch boats do not have. Uh, so unfortunately, seeing a right whale from a whale watch boat isn't necessarily the best um, experience because it's a little bit far, far away, but it's just for the right whale's own good. 
Thank you, Amy. Um, I went on a whale watch out of Gloucester uh, last year and it was a really special experience. So once everything opens back up, I very much recommend that. Um, great, okay, next question we have from John. Are any steps being taken to limit the taking of cetaceans by countries like Japan, Scotland, and China? So I can speak a little bit to this, um, but I, if someone else has the, that expertise too, um, they can jump in. So I do know that there are international oceans management bodies. The one that comes to mind in particular is the International Whaling Commission, which outlawed the, outlawed the practice of whaling in the 1930s. And I do know that this is very much on the radar of, of those bodies is figuring out a way to make sure that we can continue to protect our um, cetaceans. But I would need to do a little bit more research because a lot of my work is focused internally on the US. Does anyone have anything to add there? I'd say right whales, um, I mean, they, we have had sightings um, as far as Iceland, France. Um, so they do potentially cross the North Atlantic, but for the most part, they're spending most of their time in US and Canadian waters. Um, but in general, white whales are protected completely from whaling. And as far as I know, most of the whaling that's still happening um, is for quote unquote science, um, but mostly taking fin whales and minke whales. Uh, not that that's good, but at least their populations are in much better shape than right whales are. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, so next question we have is, where are the population surveys conducted? And I guess Amy, you could take that one too, since that seems specifically in your wheelhouse. Um, pretty much the whole um, east coast of North America. Um, there, it kind of depends on where you are of who's running the surveys and that does change. Um, but for example, aerial surveys are taking place um, quite a bit up in Canada in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Mostly right now that's by DFO, which is the um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, and then here in New England, um, North, NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center, our own aquarium, we have an aerial team, and lots of aerial surveys down off of um, the Southeast US. And then as far as vessel surveys, kind of um, similar areas by some of the similar groups. Um, but pretty much most of the East Coast of North America, with the exception of there's kind of a a little bit of a dead zone between New York and North Carolina, but for the most part, we think right whales are mostly just passing through that area. Um, not most likely not spending too much time there, which is why there hasn't really been too much of a focus to put surveys in that area. Thank you. Um, up next, we have a question for Bill about the efforts of the Calvineers um, in a remote learning. How, how is the club adapted and is it still able to do its educational work? Well, we are, but it, it limits us a little bit. I meant I, I had to forego the field trips this fall. Um, and so I had to kind of uh, fill in where uh, we adapted to Zoom really well. Um, Zoom works really well. And we're putting together a PowerPoint um, that the students will do on a Zoom meeting uh, for various groups. So we're still working, but it's it's much harder than doing things in person. And I just miss being with them. <laughs> it's definitely a challenging time right now. Okay, um, let's see. The next question we have is, has the increase in open te ocean temperatures caused a change in the migratory patterns and are they staying further north as a result? So I think both of you touched on this in your presentations. Um, so maybe Amy, if you wanna take the first crack at it and then Bill, you can jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly we know the oceans are warming. We've already seen it happening um, and it's actually happening faster in the Gulf of Maine than it is in the rest of the ocean. Um, but as I mentioned, their favorite food, the copepod only lives in cold water. So as the oceans are getting warmer, we believe that copepods are moving further north and so that means whales are traveling further north to find their food. Um, in the past five or so years, the Gulf of St. Lawrence has become a very popular feeding area for right whales now, uh, but that was not the case 10 years ago um, and before that. And so we think this the shift is a cause of um, warming oceans and, and 
partly an issue because as the whales move into new areas like the Gulf of St. Lawrence, these a lot sometimes these areas don't have the protections that their older areas do, uh, which is why we've lost so many right whales in the past three years because they moved to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which until recently didn't have any protections. Yeah, and I, I'd say that um, because uh, the whales are moving and looking for food more, uh, it's even harder to track them now. And um, so just about anywhere, they could be just about anywhere uh, on the East Coast. Um, so it's really hard to put closures in for a specific area. Um, but I hope, I hope we do get closures in for areas that, that are obvious, yeah. I, if I can add one more thing too, the fact that the food is moving means the whales have to work harder to find it and maybe even traveling further. So if the whales are still going to go to the southeast to give birth, that means their overall migration distance is even further. So it takes more energy, which then means they need to find more food. So it's a very complicated thing that's happening. <laughs> yeah, definitely all the systems and are so interconnected in our natural world. So that's why it's important that we're standing up for these species so we can kind of create a system of treating our world with natural world with respect and making sure that we are able to protect it as best we can. Great, okay. Um, next up, we have a question from Grace. What is the status of the Save Right Whales Act at this time? Um, so I can take a stab at that too, but do either of you have um, expertise in that because I can maybe I can just lead and then you one of you can fill in if, if you want to. So the Save Right Whales Act um, was introduced in the last in the last congressional session and it was introduced but it has not gone to either floor for a vote. One of our goals this year has been to get on more co-sponsors so more elected officials who sign their names saying that they support it. We um, hope that it will be reintroduced in the next upcoming congressional session. And if that is the case, we will still be looking to build more support for it and hopefully pass it over the finish line. Um, the goal of the bill is to, one of the goals is to provide funding. Um, I think it's to a tune of 5 million over the course of 10 years for the development of robust fishing technology. So it's an important component of the solution to protecting right whales is figuring out how we can um, bear that cost and pay for that cost of adopting new gear. Okay, um, a few more questions. So Reno would like to know, um, could Bill talk a little bit more about the role of the right whale in carbon sequestration? Sure, um, these reports just came out this year um, it wasn't from any right whale researchers. It was, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of who it was from, but the bottom line is, is that a, um, a 50 ton whale can sequester um, upward of, I, I think it's like 10,000 or 20,000 tons of carbon over their lifetime. And it stay, you know, and it doesn't go back into the uh, environment if the whale goes down to the bottom, uh, it gets sequestered down there. So they're, they're very useful um, to have <laughs> a big population of whales out there <laughs> as far as carbon sequestration. Um, they also add an awful lot through their feces to the uh, to the environment as far as um, producing, um, helping uh, phytoplankton uh, produce, which is what the copepods feed on. So it's kind of like a cycle there that they're doing. Yeah, the ocean does have some really powerful and interesting solutions to climate change. And it's a conversation for, I could talk about it for a really long time, um, but it's really great that right whales are a part of that picture as well. Okay, we do have a lot of questions. Um, so the next question is, I think maybe a good one for Amy, but Bill also might have something to say about it too. Um, is lack of genetic diversity another possible factor in the declining population? Yeah, um, I can't speak to anything um, 
like officially scientific on it, but we do know that, you know, the population was very, very low back in the 1930s. I, I've heard something that it's possible that there was only six genetic individuals at that time. Um, so yeah, this population is growing back from very minimal diversity, which we think can lead to poor health in general. Um, so it's definitely an issue, but it's something we're still, still trying to learn more about. We get a lot of genetic samples, so that's helpful. But I think part of it too is there's not much we can do about that part. I mean, I'd love to say let's mix up the breeding pool with some of the southern right whales, which is a different a different species, which are doing much better. Um, but it's kind of hard to do that with 50 ton animals that live in different hemispheres. <laughs> Some logistical problems among others. Um, there's been some talk about the fact that uh, maybe right whales aren't as hurt as um, as much as other populations, other species would be with a low genetic pool. Um, they seem to have um, some kind of resiliency there um, so that there, there aren't um, malformities and things like that. But Still, a lot of research needs to be done on that. And it's awesome that we have institutions like the New England Aquarium that have teams dedicated to doing that research. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Are right whales suffering from sonic testing as other types of whales are? And Amy, maybe. Yeah, I think that's another thing that we still don't know a ton about, but I would assume yes. I mean, just in general, um, the lots of all the ambient noise in the ocean interferes with a lot of the things they do, probably feeding, mating, communicating. Um, in general, they're solitary, but obviously they come together to mate. Um, and yeah, maybe migrating, they can have issues if there's extra uh, interference, knowing which way they're supposed to be going or how to find their food. Um, that's definitely something that's just a bit harder to understand quickly. I think that's going to be more of a long-term thing. But just in general, all the extra noise in the ocean is definitely not helpful. Yeah. Right. Uh, there, there's a classic story there um, uh, done by researchers at the aquarium. Um, in Back in 2001, uh, they were taking uh, fecal samples and measuring the uh, stress levels, uh, the hormones, hormones and the stress levels in whales. And in 9-11, when 9-11 happened, um, the shipping stopped and the airplane stopped and there was less noise in the Bay of Fundy. And sure enough, the samples from the feces showed less stress in the whales when there was less noise in the environment. So it's, it's definitely a stressor having noise out there. Lots of, lots of factors. So a question from Grace, how can we put more direct pressure on NOAA to act on the advisories of their own scientists? So I think I'm going to pivot this question a little bit and think about how we can make sure that the proposed rule is as strong as possible. I think when we're thinking about the ways to get our decision makers to take a bold stance and pass the kind of policy and write the kind of policy that we know is necessary to save right whales. I think the first part is building, you know, a really strong movement of support for right whales. So building a buzz around the topic, getting it in the media, writing letters to the editors and op-eds and posting on social media and tagging different decision makers in those posts. And then really weighing in when we do have the opportunity through the public comment period. That is a uh, channel designed to take in and uh, to take in the comments of the public and to learn what constituents care about and uh, the process is designed to take that into consideration. So once that proposed rule comes out, we will absolutely be in touch about opportunities, whether it's at a public hearing, whether it's by submitting a comment to stand up and make your voice heard and hopefully get some really strong protections for this special species. Um, but Bill and Amy, do either of you have anything to add? No, I think that that's a good strategy is just, you know, um, work on this current rule coming out and, and make comments and, and um, just, I think that's a good way to put pressure on people. 
I think we just need more people to care about right whales. As some people still don't even know they exist, never mind that they are struggling. Um, so tell stories. I don't know. The more people care, the better it'll go. And then when you do care, you start pushing elected officials and people who actually have power to move things along. But there's no better way to convince someone than to show them you care. Mm -hmm. And we're, the ocean is such a beautiful and special place. Um, and there are so many amazing stories about right whales out there. So we're really glad to have been able to bring some of those to you all this evening. Um, so it looks like, you know, that is all the questions that we have this evening. Um, yeah, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up. But I do want to thank you all for jumping on tonight, um, for listening to this, this presentation. And I also want to thank Amy and Bill for taking some time out of the evening to share their expertise with everyone. Um, and yeah, we will be in touch afterwards uh, with just a follow up email and some ways that you can take look to take action in the coming months. Okay, thank thanks. You. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks for having me. Thanks for hopping on, you guys. Yep. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.